going to be discussing uh, whether filters or Photoshop is the approach for uh, landscape photography. Um, now, I shoot a lot of landscapes and I tend to find these days that you can never quite trust what you're seeing because so many people spend so much time photoshopping their pictures uh, that uh, it becomes a bit of a conundrum to know what's true and what's not. Now, of course, there has always been retouch in photography since the year dot. People have been retouching their images uh, and indeed using filters is some form of adjustment of reality because you're potentially adjusting what the camera is normally seeing. But the real question is not uh, whether we're dealing with truth or not, but it's about how you want to approach your photography, uh, whether you want to spend more time out with a camera taking pictures because you love the art of photography or whether you prefer spending time sitting in front of a computer retouching your pictures to create something that you uh, saw or maybe something different to what you saw but your own version of, of what the natural world showed you. Now crucially there is no right or wrong here okay I'm, I'm not going to sit here and preach that you should do one or the other I'm going to give you my opinion uh, I'm going to tell you what I think is my personal approach and I'll explain why. And I will also explain some of the reasons why I think that's the case, okay, or why I've chosen to go down this path. And to, to, to do that, I probably need to give you a little bit of background to me. So I'm a professional photographer of goodness knows how many years and I photograph a very broad range of subjects. I suppose if you wanted to pigeonhole me anywhere, you'd maybe call me a travel photographer. Uh, but then that would ignore the sports, the corporate, the commercial, the portraits, the, the, the all sorts of other things that I do. But if we stick with travel, it's a, it's a broad church in itself. And a lot of it, uh, for me, comes down to shooting landscapes. I love being out in the natural world. Uh, I love seeing the natural world, seeing landscapes, watching them evolve through the day as the light changes, and obviously capturing them with a camera. And because of that, because I love being out in the natural world, that's my favourite habitat, I would much rather be there with a camera in my hands than sat in front of a computer staring at a screen for time immemorial trying to create a picture out of what I captured. I kind of see it as a, a distinction between photography and digital art. Neither one is more correct than the other one. It's about your own personal interpretation of what you want to do. And that, as I say, is a very crucial point to, to take away. I'm not, uh, I, I don't look down or look differently on anyone else, but in my mind, there is a difference between photography and digital art. And so for me, when I'm taking a picture, my goal is always to get the picture as accurate as I possibly can in the camera. Okay, quite simply, that's my goal. That's what I want to achieve. That means I then don't have to spend hours on a computer trying to create something, which when you're creating a lot of pictures is really beneficial. Otherwise you end up not getting through all your pictures. You limit the amount of creativity you've got. You limit your output. Uh, so I'm going to explain why. We're going to talk about uh, filters. We're going to talk a bit about Photoshop as well and what they can and can't do for you. Uh, there is, uh, there is a, a live Q&A, uh, so should you wish to ask questions, if I look over here it's probably because I'm looking to see whether there uh, are any questions and I will do my best to answer them as we go along. Uh, I'll also tell you a bit about the filters that I use uh, too, and obviously this is, uh, this is a session brought to you by H&Y. I am an H&Y filter user and hopefully it will become clear as to why that is uh, as we go through. So we're going to see uh, we're going to see a, a, a collection of my pictures and, and explain why I take the approach that I do and also hopefully give you some tips on how you can maybe um, more accurately use filters to, to get the picture, get the results that you want when you're out shooting. So, when you're out, here's a, a shot of the Great Wall of China. You will see another one of these uh, a little later on. You're in a situation where you are photographing sunrise or sunset. We know that if you're a landscape photographer, they are the two most common times of day that you're going to be out frequenting the world because that's when the light is most beautiful, when the shadows are long, uh, when you get all the beautiful colours, and if you're lucky, where you get the place all to yourself. 
you get to feel like you own all of this creation in front of you because there's nobody else around. Now in this situation, sunrise or sunset, you are faced with an expanded or extensive dynamic range. Namely, the brightness of the sky is substantially greater than the brightness of the foreground. And no matter how good cameras are, we can't quite capture all of that dynamic range yet. Our eyes can see it because our eyes can spontaneously adjust to allow us to see a very expanded dynamic range. We can see all the detail in the sky when we look up to the bright areas and we can equally see all of the detail down in the shadows. But unfortunately, cameras aren't there yet. We are seeing improvements for sure. Um, new cameras are pushing the boundaries of dynamic range that they can capture. Uh, and we're also seeing um, the rise of HDR. Now we've had HDR for a while where you may composite three or more pictures at different brightness settings um, to then put them together later on. But we're now getting to a stage where cameras can do an HDR image in one single shot. So for example, some of the latest Canon cameras will shoot uh, in what's called PQ or perceptual quantization curve HDR, which more closely mimics how your eye uh, sees a, a wide dynamic range scene. But they are few and far between those cameras. And the reality is that HDR can be a bit, uh, a bit like Marmite. Some people love it, some people don't like it at all. In my opinion, HDR needs to be done very, very carefully, otherwise it can start looking unnatural. And that actually is also true of filters. If you over filter something, you can turn a natural looking scene into something that looks unnatural. If you over filter a sky to make it darker, we instinctively think when we look at a scene, we almost instinctively know that the foreground is going to be darker than the sky. So if you over filter a sky to make it too dark, unless you're doing it for some kind of creative, dramatic mood purpose, in which case it can work quite well, then you end up creating a scene that just doesn't quite look right. And the goal, in my opinion, should always be to try and create something that looks as natural as possible. So when we're out taking pictures, we face a challenge. This sunrise, sunset, expanded dynamic range that I'm talking about uh, means that with the camera not being able to capture it all as one, we need a method to do that. And in my opinion, filters are the solution. A filter at its simplest, uh, when we're talking about ND grads, is simply dark at the top and clear at the bottom. And because it's dark at the top and clear at the bottom, we can slide that dark part over the top part of the frame, over the bright part of the frame, and that brings down the brightness so that it more closely matches the brightness of the foreground. So in a situation like this where we've got a rising sun coming up behind that headland, that sky is much brighter than the foreground rocks, particularly than the shaded side of the foreground rocks. There's no way the camera can capture all of that detail. But with the use of uh, an ND grad, we can bring the sky down, we can match it in terms of its brightness value to the foreground and thereby create a more natural looking image. Now, you'll all be saying, yes, but I can do this on Photoshop, Dave. Of course you can. Uh, you know, raw converters like Lightroom, or if you take the, the, the image through your raw converter and into Photoshop, you can put a whole new sky on there if you want. You can change the brightness. You're working with a camera, particularly for shooting in raw, that's going to have a fair amount of dynamic range and a fair amount of ability to pull that sky back. But I'd come back to my original point and suggest that, would you rather be out in an environment like this, this is in Mallorca, looking at a beautiful sunrise, trying to capture that as best you can, thereby giving you the best start point possible? Or would you rather be back at home, sitting in front of your computer, in my case in Southeast London, where it's dreary and dull, looking at a computer, trying to create an image that you could have got on location at the time of shooting. For me, as I said, it's all about getting it right there, right then. Now, another example, this is in China, we're back in China, so actually there's a couple of Chinese pictures in here. Now this is the Forbidden City, uh, a situation where this is not sunrise or sunset, the sun is now well up, but we're photographing uh, a reflection. Compositionally, I've got the 
the subject right in the middle of the frame, the reflection is right in the middle, and from a compositional perspective, uh, that can work for reflections. If you've got a beautifully clear reflection, why not use a 50-50 split on your, on your composition? You don't necessarily have to follow the rule of thirds. In fact, the rule of thirds, taking a little detour here, is actually more just a guideline. It's just a start point. You should feel free to break it. Now, when you're shooting a reflection like this, you may imagine you don't need filters, but actually you probably do. You probably need about a two stop grad when you're doing a reflection because the foreground, the water in this case, will not be reflecting 100% of the light that's coming from above. So you're probably going to need about two stops of filtration to bring the sky down to match the foreground. Now, if you're using uh, the H and Y filters, one of the reasons I use the H and Y filters is because they've got the brilliant magnetic filter holder. It makes it really quick to put filters on and take filters off. Uh, there's no guides to slide them in. You can just stick them together. The magnets hold them on nice and tight. And you've got the ability then to slide your grad up and down to match exactly where your horizon line is. So it works really well in this kind of environment where, let's face it, whenever you're shooting in natural light, the light changes far more rapidly than you imagine it would. So uh, I'll give you an example here. This is in, uh, this is in New Zealand, uh, in South Island, New Zealand. And uh, it's Lake Matheson, it's called the Mirror Lake. So we've got another reflection. If you're at somewhere called the Mirror Lake, then let's face it, you, you're probably going to shoot a reflection. That is Mount Cook in the background. Uh, and this is actually a picture that required quite a bit of luck, but also quite a bit of filtration. Uh, and I know some of you are probably kind of turning your head upside down because it feels like it might be the wrong way up because the reflection of the mountain is down in the foreground. Um, but here, a bit like the previous image, it's a situation where you need the filtration, but the filtration is actually at the bottom rather than the top. Because if you look at it, the brightness of what would be the sky, but is actually the, the mountains at the top of the frame, is, is the darker area, and the sky is at the bottom. Now, if you were using ordinary screw-on round filters, you've got no ability to position a grad line where you want it. It's just wherever it is when you screw the filter on. But filters like H and Y that give you a rectangular filter give you the ability to put it on upside down. So by putting it on upside down, I can slide the grad on to cover the sky, thereby darkening that foreground as it is, the reflection, to match what's going on above. And that's part of the beauty of working with grad filters. It gives you that flexibility, that ability to, to change the look of the scene right there, right then. Now, there are some things um, that you can't do in Photoshop. And uh, one of those things is, is polarization. But what I want you to see here with these two pictures, we'll come to polarization in a moment. What I want you to see here is just that change in light. These pictures are taken maybe 10 minutes apart. Okay. Now, both of them are pleasant pictures in their own right. They're both nice shots. If you had to Photoshop both of these images, or maybe even a sequence, if you took five or six pictures, because let's be honest, nobody goes out and takes one picture per sunrise or one picture per sunset. If you had to come back and then Photoshop all of the pictures to, to create the result that you want, you're going to spend so much time in front of the computer that it's just not practical. You'll never see your family because you'll be too busy sitting at your computer, staring at a screen, trying to get everything to look nice because with the best will in the world, it's not something you can automate. No matter how advanced Photoshop is, you can't automate adding a grad on because the exact positioning is so crucial. The exact amount of filtration is incredibly crucial. So it's another reason why I contest that using filters at the point of shooting is a better approach than relying on Photoshop later. Now, that's not to say that we can't use Photoshop, because if we've got a better start point, if we've got much closer to what we want it to be at the point of shooting, but it's still not quite right, then you're still working with, a, with an easier start point. It doesn't require a huge amount of pixel lifting. And what you have probably discovered with most digital cameras these days, because you're working with whatever dynamic range the camera has, if 
something is overexposed. If it's blown, you cannot bring it back. No matter what the, the manufacturers will tell you, no matter what the software manufacturers will tell you, if you have overexposed part of a scene, that detail is gone. It's not coming back. Equally, if you underexpose part of a scene, so the shadows are blocked up, you can't recreate the detail that there would have been in there. So why try? Why put yourself through that hassle, through the challenges uh, of doing that? Now, I'd mentioned polarization, but before we get to that, I'm actually going to talk a little bit about long exposure instead, because it's another area where Photoshop struggles to recreate what you would do in a long exposure situation. So here we're at uh, Zabriskie Point. Uh, this is in Death Valley National Park. Uh, and I hope that once this uh, pandemic is uh, out of the way and we can all get back to traveling, that you know, I can end up back over here because it's one of my favorite places uh, to shoot in America. Such a fantastic place to go. Now this is the image shot with an indie drag, um, but uh, no long exposure. So it's just a reasonably short exposure. And uh, I don't know, you know, I don't know if it's subjective, right? So I um, can't say that you like it or say that you like it or not. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Again, it can be a bit like Marmite. Some people will, some people won't. So let me give you the long exposure version. This, as I said, is the short exposure. If we go to a solid ND filter, um, so this is not a grad, this is just uniformly dark across the frame, we get the ability to cut down the amount of light that's coming into the, uh, that's coming into, uh, the camera and thereby to exp um, expand uh, or extend our shutter speed uh, and thereby create this long exposure effect so if you have a look you've got uh, um, you've got the clouds there's now that movement in the cloud um, where we get some kind of sense of drama of cloud movement of motion within a landscape and that's something that a solid nd filter gives to you and something that you would struggle to do as i said in photoshop yeah you can put motion blur on but unless you really, really, really know what you're doing, uh, it can be a, a bit of a challenge and it takes a long time. I'll give you a couple more examples as well. Uh, so here we go. This is now in Rye, back in the UK, down at Rye Harbour. Uh, and it's not the nicest picture in the world. It's got some lovely light. It's a beautiful sunrise um, and some really lovely colours. But it's pretty dull. There's not much going on in it. But the use of a long exposure, so the use of, uh, you know, a six or ten stop solid filter gives us the ability to drag out that shutter speed and thereby create something that is far more interesting with a much longer, uh, much longer exposure. OK, and and so this is another reason why I love filters at the point of shooting, because I can see what this looks like. I can visualize it at the point I've taken the picture and and I can then make a decision as to whether I need to go longer on the shutter speed to get more motion, in which case I need to use a, a heavier ND, or whether I need to go lighter, in which case I use a, a softer ND. Yeah, one that's gonna let a bit more light in. And that gives you creative control at the point of shooting rather than waiting until you get back home. Uh, one more, this is now uh, up in the Lake District. This is Brandle Howe Jetty. Uh, you know, Lake District is full of these jetties and to show you that it works in black and white as well. In fact, in black and white, oftentimes when you're just faced with with tone uh, and and shape and form rather than colours, it can be even more dramatic. So now where you get that light patch of cloud and, and the dark brooding clouds around it, you get the ability to really bring some drama into a scene by using a solid ND filter. Now, when you're working by water, um, one of the things that can often happen, obviously not in this picture, but potentially one you saw earlier on and maybe one you're going to see in a bit. Uh, one of the things that, that can happen is that you end up getting water on the front of your filters. Uh, and uh, it, it might be that it's water splash. It might be that 
because we're out in all weathers, we end up with rain hitting the front of the filters. Uh, and this is another reason why, uh, why I use the HMY filter system. It's because the filters themselves are made of glass. Uh, unlike other, some other manufacturers that, that use resin, um, resin filters can be a bit of a pain to clean and also they can be a little bit fragile. They can be prone to picking up scratches. Whereas the HMY filters are made of Corning Gorilla Glass 3, uh, which is a glass you may have heard of. Uh, it's incredibly durable. Uh, it's very hard to break. It's very hard to scratch. And if you get water on it, it just requires a quick wipe with a cloth and it cleans all of the water off it and you're good to shoot again. None of the standing around for five minutes trying to polish water off a resin filter, then getting the, the lens cleaning fluid out, polishing some more, uh, it, it, it's a real pain. Now, I just take my lens cloth, wipe across the top of it, and the water just beads off it beautifully. So in a situation where it might be raining or you've got water spray coming up from, I don't know, could be a, uh, could be a stream, could be wave splash if you're down by the sea, uh, in those kind of situations, it just speeds up your working. You don't have to spend that time sitting there cleaning the filters. And equally, accidents do happen. If you, if you drop, uh, drop a resin filter, the chances are it's going to be scratched and you're going to be putting it in the bin. Um, if you drop a Corning Gorilla Glass filter, an HMY filter, uh, they are ridiculously durable and also ridiculously flexible. And in fact, on the subject of the water, because of the way they mount together, when you put them together, if you stack multiple filters together as one, um, because they're magnets, there's no gap between them, which means you're less likely to get water falling down in between the filters. So most times you only need to clean the front filter, not each of the filters in whatever filter stack you may be using. So it's just another good reason for, for looking not just at how the filters mount, but also what the filters are made of. Uh, right, next up. Just another one of these long exposures, because it's not all about the long exposures for cloud movement, for creating that kind of drama, but it's also long exposures in this kind of situation where you've got flowing water. Uh, now this is Ashness Bridge, again, up in the Lake District. It's a beautiful stream, a little pack horse bridge. Uh, it's an incredibly famous viewpoint, incredibly well photographed. Um, but when you've got some kind of flowing water like this, it really does pay to, to try and do something with it, not just rely on a, whatever shutter speed you get, which may be fast or slow, depending on how much light there is, but actually take control of the situation while you're there shooting. Take control of it in the sense of decide exactly what shutter speed you want to give the creative look that you're looking for. So in this case, I wanted to turn the water into this kind of milky frothiness. Having filtration on hand gives you that ability to decide exactly where it should be, exactly how long that shutter speed needs to be. Do you want it to be uh, maybe a little bit uh, a little bit faster because then you're going to get a bit more contrast in the water and you'll get in this case maybe some of the uh, some of the kind of the white bits of the water will be a bit more distinct or do you go slower on your shutter speed with a heavier ND, uh, ND filter uh, and turn it into a bit more milky effect as I've done with this image. Okay, where are we now? Another situation where, where filters, in my opinion, reign over Photoshop. Uh, now, we are back on the Great Wall of China. And yes, if you're very good at Photoshop and you're willing to spend a lot of time editing a picture, it is possible to remove people from a scene. But if you've not been to somewhere like the Great Wall of China, and in fact, this is gonna become ever more common uh, over the next few months and year as the world comes out of lockdown, famous places, famous landmarks, famous views are going to be ever more swamped with people because everyone's going to be desperate to get out uh, and see these places that we've been starved of seeing for so long. Now, if you want to get a picture that has nobody in it, you either have to be incredibly lucky, in which case you're waiting uh, until everyone's gone, which in most cases is probably not going to happen. Or you need to spend a lot of time on the computer removing people one by one, cloning them out, um, you know, either cloning them out or heel tooling them out uh, and hoping to get a good result. Or alternatively, you just put a very, very heavy solid ND. 10, 15, 16 stop ND, stack them together to give yourself a ridiculously long exposure, by which I mean five, 10 minutes 
uh, of, of exposure time. And what you'll find in that situation, uh, it's a bit like the images um, from years back when they used to say they'd photographed ghosts. Um, if you have a very long exposure, um, when people are moving, they tend to just disappear. And if they're moving enough, they will completely disappear. And you end up with a scene like this, where although there's a lot of people walking up and down this section of the Great Wall of China, you can't really see anybody. They've all just evaporated away into nothingness because they stayed moving. Now, if you look very carefully uh, at this image, um, probably two thirds, uh, somewhere just below the horizon line, just as the wall bends around, you can see there's a bit of a ghost uh, of a couple that decided they wanted to stand there and take a selfie. Clearly my shutter speed was not long enough to get rid of them, uh, but the, the process still stands. The theory still works. If you put a very long exposure into an image, you get the ability to remove people right there and then. It's like, it's like a sleight of hand magic trick where they just disappear in front of the camera and you're left with that wonderful scene of wherever you are being completely free of people, being, being devoid, being able to concentrate on, in this case, the structure of the Great Wall of China and the environment in which it's in, rather than being distracted by hundreds of people milling around. Okay, now, another long exposure. And it's a different example of long exposure because yes, the light levels are lower, so the exposure directly on the camera itself was going to be lower. But also, we've got this light trail of a car, okay, or in fact, multiple cars going up and down uh, to this lighthouse. And the reality is in this situation, again, it's not something you can do in Photoshop unless you want to fake it, okay? Unless you can just paint in light trails, and indeed it is entirely possible to do, um, you're not going to do this naturally without using a filter and waiting for those cars to go up and down the road. So again, it's that long exposure, solid ND, giving me, uh, in this case, maybe, uh, I think it was about an eight minute exposure. That meant that I also got the light in the lighthouse coming round because, you know, it's going round at whatever interval it's, it's flashing. So I get that little bit of a starburst of light up there because it gradually builds up with each passing second in the exposure. But I also give the opportunity for more and more cars to go up and down that road, thereby creating that light trail and giving me a bit more depth and interest in the scene rather than it just being a road with some rocky headland and some sea in the background. OK, so it's that creative control that filters bring you at the point of shooting that for me means they are the best approach. Uh, and that's why I never, ever go out without my filters. Uh, it's why I, I will be using filters uh, no matter how good cameras get. I will be using ND grad filters and solid ND filters uh, until I stop taking pictures, which is hopefully, uh, hopefully a very long time in the future, if ever. Uh, another sort of situation here, right now I, I talked, uh, I talked a bit about the massive dynamic range and it normally being sunrise sunset. You also face this once the sun is a bit higher over the horizon. So this is, it's still morning, um, but the sun has risen quite a way. It's fortunately behind a cloud. And in this case, I've used a heavier grad to provide some more drama. Now, how do you know exactly what grad you need to use uh, at the point of shooting? Well, it comes with a bit of experience. But most cameras these days give you a really good guide. So most cameras, if you're shooting in, uh, if you're shooting in live view, for example, uh, you can get a live histogram on the back of your camera, which shows you exactly what the picture is going to look like in terms of its brightness value. And for those of you that aren't sure what histograms are, that's the graph you get on the back of your camera. To the left hand side is the shadows, to the right hand side is the highlights, and the goal is that we contain all of the dynamic range within the area of that histogram. So not touching the left hand edge, not touching the right hand edge. So how do we go about it? Well, for me, I set up the camera, I choose my frame and my composition, I choose exactly where I want it to be. Uh, and then I start working out what my exposure is going to be. So I have an idea maybe of how much depth of field I want. So I'm going to set my aperture. Uh, I've already set my ISO. By and large, my ISO is going to be 100 because I want the best image quality possible uh, with the least image noise possible. Uh, so ISO set, aperture is set to give me the appropriate depth of field based on where I'm focusing uh, in the frame. 
and then I need to work out what my shutter speed is. So the easy way to do this is look at your histogram and adjust the shutter speed until the shadows, so that's going to be the foreground uh, in most cases, until they are not quite touching the bottom left hand edge of your histogram. At that point, you know that you have got all of the detail in all of the shadow areas of that scene. Okay, they're not going to be blocked up, you're not going to lose detail in that shadow area. Then look at the highlights. Look at the, the right hand edge of the histogram and see how much of the, the tones are being pushed off the right hand edge. And you can then do a very simple test. Change your shutter speed and count how many clicks you have to change it. Now it would depend on whether your camera is set to half stops, whole stops or third stops for its exposure increments. But you can make an adjustment on your shutter speed. Watch the histogram as it closes down. So effectively you're going to make your shutter speed faster. So shutter speed gets faster, the histogram will move in from the right hand edge. And at the point that it's no longer touching the right hand edge, and you've made a, a decision based on how bright you want the brightest part of the scene to be. So if you've got a really bright area like this scene where there's the sun almost poking through that cloud, I know that that's going to be right on the right hand edge, but not quite touching. I can adjust the shutter speed until it's just pulled in from the right hand edge, count the number of clicks that it took to, to get there, and then work out how much filtration I need. So do I need, for example, if it's six clicks, my camera is set to thirds of a stop, I need two stops of ND. Okay, and it gives you a good ballpark. So once you've got that calculated, you then move the shutter speed back to where it was for the shadows to look great, take your two stop ND grad and slide it into position. And as you slide it in, you should see that histogram pulling in from the right hand side back to exactly where you wanted it to be. And at that point, you're good to shoot. It makes life so much easier than trying to guesstimate which filter it is. It gives you that knowledge that you're definitely going to be within the right ballpark. And then you decide, do you want to do it with one filter or do you need to do it with two perhaps? If you need to stagger the gradation, uh, perhaps you need, um, I don't know, you want a hard grad because there's a hard line and then you want a soft grad to feather it in because there's a brighter patch at the top perhaps. Uh, and that's something you can do very easily with the H and Y system, with the magnets, just stack more and more filters. And because there's no gap between them, because they sit right up close, you actually get the ability to put a few more filters in there before they start vignetting uh, on your wide angle lenses. Okay, moving on. Um, back in Mallorca, we've, we've come back to Mallorca now. And here we've got a situation where uh, I want to capture the lights of the, of the town, it's Port de Sierra. Uh, and I need to capture the lights in that foreground area because that brings the town alive. Uh, it shows that something going on whilst balancing that against the sky in the background, that beautiful kind of post sunset pastel glow as the sun's going down and all the colors start to appear. And it's another situation where actually you just can't do it in one. Now this actually is quite a, quite a complex picture. There's a bit more going on to this than just ND grads. And that's why I say that it's not a hard and fast rule. You're not going to just go with ND grads or just go with Photoshop, but you may well use a blend of them. In this case, I actually used a torch as well, because no matter what I tried to balance the, the town lights with those uh, foreground trees and keep some detail in them, I needed to add in a little bit of light. So now there's uh, a solid uh, ND grad, uh, solid ND, sorry, to give me a bit of a longer exposure so that the water goes nice and smooth and calm. There's a grad to hold the sky, and now I'm standing there light painting with a torch just to bring a little bit of detail, very gently, into those trees in the foreground, just to give them a little bit of lift. Because there's almost stages of brightness within the frame, and that's where you, you may struggle. Now, some people will say, great, Dave, why did you bother with the torch? You could have done that in Photoshop. Yep, I absolutely could have done. Um, but see the previous point uh, that, I have, uh, that I've potentially... Uh, um, I've potentially over egged. Um, I would rather be out doing this, playing with it there and then enjoying time out in the wilds uh, than sitting at the computer trying to fix something I could have done uh, live on location. Um, and as I said, actually, when you're shooting for a client, um, if you've got to generate a lot of pictures, 
um, you you want to minimize the amount of time you have to spend editing things on the computer so if i'm doing travel pictures that includes a lot of landscapes maybe it's for a magazine a brochure or something like that i've got to provide a collection of pictures um, they're paying me a, a fixed amount of money if i have to do the shoot which is going to take time and then spend hours on a computer making the pictures look great i've just decreased the amount of money i'm earning per hour i've decreased the amount of money that i theoretically could have earned for that shoot because it's taken me two three four times as long as it needed to so it's not just about wanting to be out taking pictures it's about maximizing the return of the, the as a professional the amount of money i get per shoot by not spending more time on it than i need to to create the pictures i want again back in uh, back in majorca uh, and uh, we have got another long exposure and a grad as well. So stacking these filters together. Uh, and you'll find with the H and Y system that actually if you wanted to use a polarizer, um, you, you can use a polarizer combined uh, with an ND. Uh, and because of the way they stack, they stack really beautifully to avoid this kind of vignetting. So uh, the polarizer, for example, or a solid ND sits at the back of the stack closest to the lens and then uh, your grads would fit on top of it. Uh, it makes for a really simple, easy to use system uh, that when you're on location with the light changing all the time, it's something you, you don't have to think about. Um, and that's one of the reasons why, why I use the HMI system, because it does make my life genuinely that bit easier than, uh, than what I was doing before. Okay, we are pretty much getting to the end of our session um, we've got a couple more pictures uh, to show you again a massively strong dynamic range scene you've got Mont Blanc and the Agri Vert in the background with the sun hitting it's the far side of the Chamonix Valley this is Lac Blanc in the foreground um, one of the one of the areas you need to be careful of uh, and this is actually a situation where combining a little bit of Photoshop with a little bit of filtration uh, is is a benefit is you put a grad on and that shadowed area on the right hand side could run the risk of becoming a little bit too dark. But if you're very careful with how you position the filters and how you set your exposure, then it gives you the ability, as I said, that better starting point. I haven't blocked anything up in that shadow. So when I bring the image onto the computer, I've got the ability to open that shadow up a little bit more easily than if it was just completely blocked out to black and thereby create the little bit of depth in the scene that having the detail on that shadow area brings to the picture. Uh, again, another, uh, another situation, very similar. Again, we've got a shaded area of a rock in the foreground. We've got a lovely reflection. Um, we just need to balance the brightness between the, the foreground uh, and the sky in the background. Uh, and for me, if I can sit and watch the light come up like this, as I said before, if I can sit and watch the light uh, watch it change on the landscape. I feel more connected to the landscape. I feel it improves my pictures. It gives me uh, a better connection to what's going on uh, and overall uh, something that I'm, I'm more happy with. To be able to walk away knowing that I've got the picture, seeing it on the back of the camera, knowing that it's pretty much how I want it to be is a warm fuzzy feeling that I absolutely enjoy and for me that's why um, I, I much prefer uh, filters over Photoshop. Okay, I'm leaving you with a with a shot of Cornwall. Might be one of the first places I go when lockdown uh, ends. This is St Michael's Mount. Um, a long exposure, solid ND combined with an ND grad to balance that light in the foreground and the light in the background and create uh, a, a hopefully beautiful looking scene. Uh, that is the end of my session. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed uh, enjoy the rest of this virtual photography show and I'll see you all again next time. Bye-bye for now.